Greetings, my fellow free and love sovereign thinkers. This is LL3's newest podcast. My name is Craig, transmitting from the beautiful swampy mangroves of South Florida. And today's date is Friday, June 16th, 2017. Yeah, so I'm gonna be, uh, I'm not gonna be going too long. It'll be another brief episode, which is okay. It's one of those days, of course. <laughs> And um, I read this yesterday from Justia. It's a very interesting commentary about fundamentals remaining faithful to freedom of speech and, ec- and academic freedom. This is by uh, Verdict, which is from Justia, verdict.justia.com, and is written by Vikram David Amar. And this is entitled Re- Remaining Faithful to Free Speech and Academic Freedom. Like, as it reads here, it distresses me to see episodes these days in which speakers who are controversial for their conservative or ultra-conservative views are prevented from delivering invited remarks at universities, including public universities, because protesters choose to violate laws designed to protect public safety. It also distresses me to see so few liberals analysts decry how illiberal these episodes of groups imposed censorship are. As I have written at length elsewhere, no matter how impressive or otherwise apparent a speaker's message, the appropriate response under a constitution is counter speech, not shouting down or physically obstructing or threatening the speaker or the speaker's audience. To be sure, protesting the speaker's presence, registering profound objection to a speaker's viewpoint is perfectly appropriate and has a rich tradition dating even from even before the 1960s free speech revolution through the Occupy movement. But when what we've seen over the past several months is a transition from protests against bad speakers to preventing them from being able to speak, and that is not unacceptable. An unflinching commitment to freedom of speech, even odious, racist, sexist, hateful speech, is the cornerstone of the constitutional democracy of the United States. Certainly, you protect freedom of speech more vigorously than any other Western democracy. We also have a venerable tradition of respecting academic freedom at colleges and universities. These two principles, freedom of speech and academic freedom, overlap and are interconnected, even as they are distinct ideas. Freedom of speech is broadly applicable, right codified in the Federal First Amendment and the state constitution analogs that protect speakers from both on and off public campuses from unwarranted government interference with expression, academic freedom, which may extend beyond what the Constitution protects, is grounded on the idea that, at least in the academy, free inquiry, unburdened by the constraints of orthodoxy, will lead to the development of new ideas and knowledge. Notwithstand, notwithstanding their different scopes, both freedom of speech and academic freedom rest on the bedrock belief that ideas and arguments ought to be evaluated on their substance. The es- essence of both kinds of freedom is the opportunity to persuade others of the merits of one's argument rather than the view- views of power to coerce others into acceding to the proponent's point of view. Sometimes the least the heat and passion of political protest on college campuses causes these basic principles to be overlooked or ignored. When that happens, it is important for us to go back to what freedom of speech and academic freedom really means and how easily both of these principles can be misused and misinterpreted. Governments can and should prohibit certain obstructive conduct. The short of the matter is that blockading, obstructing, assaulting, destroying property, and making threats are not in any stretch of the imagination. Constitutionally protected things to do, no matter what the objective behind them. These activities are conduct. Our conduct, the government has always had a legitimate authority to proscribe because they so obviously interfere with liberty and lawful pursuits of others. As as the Supreme Court of California stated in an important free speech case in reference to Ray K. 
The state retains a legitimate concern in ensuring that some individuals' unruly assertions of their rights of free expression does not imperil other citizens' rights of free association and discussion. Freedom of everyone to talk at once can destroy the right of anyone effectively to talk at all. Free expression can expire as tragically in the atonement of license as in the license silence of censorship. Government's actions to prohibit blockades or obstruction have been held to be permissible under the First Amendment too many times to count. To cite just one example of federal law, the Freedom of Access to Clinic Entrance Act, or FACE, that prohibits anyone from physically obstructing any person from attaining or providing reproductive health services has been held repeatedly against constitutional challenge. And those cases raise harder questions than do generic obstruction laws because face targets specific places where protesters with particular messages may be expected. Blockades and obstructions can and should be prohibited consistent with the First Amendment, primarily because they are not intended to and do not persuade anyone of the merits of the protesters' position. They are employed to converse third parties to change their behavior, not their minds. As such, they are actually antithetical to, rather than the furtherance of the values on which freedom of speech and academic freedom are grounded. A commitment to the power of ideas rather than the use of force to change the way what people, that people act. Creative but unveiling counter-arguments. In recent weeks, I've heard defenders of those who obstruct conservative speakers make two novel but completely unconvincing arguments. First, the obstruction defenders try to invoke the civil rights movement by pointing out that Martin Luther King and his supporters were often guilty of civil disobedience that violated duly enacted law. But this analogy is unveiling because King and his followers were violating laws that were in the eyes of the protesters and many others, themselves unjust, not laws that were completely um, unobjectionable, but simply stood in the way of the desires of the violators. Another distinction between the two settings is that, to the extent that civil rights protesters violate laws regularly in their political activity, they were violating laws in order to be heard themselves, not in order to prevent others from being heard. But today's obstructors cannot credibly complain that they cannot be heard. They simply want others not to be listened to. The second creative yet deeply flawed argument I've heard in the defense of the obstructors is the idea that controversial speakers of the kind who are being suppressed are themselves not appropriate speakers to be invited to university settings because they are not sufficiently academic in character. Putting aside the fact that these speakers were invited, whether they ought to have been or not, and putting aside whether some of those, these speakers have do some academic bona fides, even if their ideas are often very wrong-headed, this argument mischaracterizes the kinds of speakers who belong at universities. Higher education is not a, is not, is a place not just to sharpen one's critical thinking skills, so exposure to brilliant academics who make data-informed arguments in multiple directions. It is also a place where one should learn how to become a full citizen in American society. As the Supreme Court observed in the context of high school students in Tinker versus Des Moines Independent School District, this often means that students need to engage each other on the contentious political issues of the day. And in today's college world, this sometimes means hearing and evaluating strident political advocates, some of whom went even brought border or demagoguery. To be sure, student and faculty organizations should give some thought, perhaps more than th- more thought than they currently do, to the question of whom they invite to speak on campus. Certainly not everyone should be offered a platform, but many campus speakers on the left as well as the right are not particularly grounded in rigorous theoretical or empirical analysis. 
And this does not mean they are per se inappropriate speakers for college for college audiences. Again, colleges should be preparing young people not just to navigate the economy, but also to navigate democracy. And for better or worse, modern democracy means having to deal with a lot of ideas that are widely held, even though they don't hold up to an analytic rigor. Debunking those ideas, not shouting them down or trying to suppress their expression is what I want my stu students to learn how to do. Nicely done there, Mr. Obama. Nicely done. It was really intriguing, too, because uh, for sure, one thing for sure, my friends, that's why freedom of speech, debate, honorable discussions are absolutely vital. And what I've seen at some, uh, some of the actions that occurred at Berkeley, I condemn with a passion. I call these bastards out because what they're doing is playing Draconian 1984. Shut people down. Don't think for yourselves. We don't want to hear your views. Because if we're right, you're wrong. We're the chosen one. That's when it gets scary. This is why when I do a show like this, I want you folks to contemplate thoroughly share your discussions, and so forth. I have folks out there who are activists may have different views. But one thing we do is respect each other dearly and watch each other's backs when we go to rallies. We can say comrades, allies, that's fine by me. But one thing for sure, when you, when you do these rallies, you want to plant the seeds, get people to think. Be the teacher, the rabbi, not the tyrant, not the glamour person. But the world should revolve around me because you know what? It's going to bite you in the rear when they suspect it. Or in other words, blow back. So, what you want to do? You want to preserve our natural born rights, including yours? Or have division so it will be ruled by the state? Something to think about. That's where freedom of conscience comes in, which Thomas Jefferson brought out, addressed. And you have to preserve it or lose it. I say, keep it going. This is part of our Bill of Rights culture. Natural law should always be honored. And that is it, my friends. As I say, it's short and sweet. I'd like to thank everyone for listening. Plus, feel free and download download and share this throughout your social media networks. If you have any questions, comments, or you're saying something that's interesting and may want to check out, whatever you do, please address your correspondence with Decorum. You can hit me on Facebook, Twitter, Google+, Breaker, iHeartRadio, Tumblr, YouTube, Freedoms Network, Scene.life, Minds.com, FutureNet.club, or Patron.com slash LokiLuck3 with three eyes. Furthermore, you can email me at LokiLuck3 at gmail.com, which is the number three all together, or LokiLuck03, which is all together, at ProtonMail.com for you encrypted types. All right, my friends, once again, thank you for your time. Plus, always remember that demoniac resistance is healthy for the soul and can liberate humanity. Until next time, take care of yourselves. Keep on spreading the love. May your guardian spirits be with you.